Good morning and welcome to Unity Myrtle Beach Sunday service for October 11th, 2020. I am happy to be with you. My name is Reverend Margaret Hiller. I am the spiritual leader at Unity Myrtle Beach and we give thanks for our wonderful music team, Dave Lacombe, Anton Noel Ruffo and Paula Cross. Thank you so much team and Lesta Sue Hardy for helping us with all of the technological uh, issues involved in pre-recording our service for today. Thank you, Lesta. And please join me in welcoming our friend and brother, Reverend Dr. Preston McKeever Floyd. He's been with us many times before and we welcome him back today to speak with us on the topic, in the world, but not of it. And I am so appreciative of the message today. Reverend Dr. Preston McKeever Floyd is the founder and CEO of the Preston McKeever Floyd Youth Sports Academy in Liberia, and also former chair and associate professor of philosophy and religious studies at Coastal Carolina University. So I invite us all to take a deep healing breath and we set intention today that we pause, that we breathe deeply, that our eyes are open, our ears are open, our hearts are open to hear and sense and see deeply all that needs to be known at this time. As Preston often says in his Facebook post, consider and reflect. So we set intention today to consider and reflect. Blessings on the message. Namaste. So I'd like to share with you today Unity's daily word not for Sunday, October 11th. I'm going to be a bit of a rebel and read the one for tomorrow, Monday, October 12th, which has in the past been acknowledged as Columbus Day. And in recent decades, more and more, the date of October 12th is seen as Indigenous Peoples Day. So I'd like to read Unity's message after I acknowledge the names of some of the tribes that lived and some still live in South Carolina, and particularly the Myrtle Beach, South Carolina area. So some of the names that will be familiar to you, some of the tribes who have lived and some still do in the area of South Carolina. We acknowledge 
and respect the ancestors of the Cherokee, the Catawba, the Yamasee, the Chikora, the Edisto, the PD, the Santee, the Sam Pitts, the Seawees, and the Wakamas. We acknowledge the ancestors of this land. And Unity's word for today is diversity. And the affirmation is, I honor the sacredness of all beings. I encounter a magnificent variety of people in my neighborhood, school, workplace, and community. We may be different in cultural backgrounds, gender, beliefs, appearance, or in myriad other ways, but we are all expressions of God. I celebrate the diversity of the human family, and I am grateful for my place in it. I bless our oneness as spiritual beings, and I also honor our differences. I show respect for all people and learn about cultures and customs other than my own. I open my heart to all others in the spirit of friendship and inclusion, and as I do, my world expands. I salute the light within each person and the sacredness of all beings. We are one in spirit. And from the book of John, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So let that be a part of our intention today as well, that we love one another. I continue with the Lord's Prayer at Unity of Myrtle Beach. We use the translation from Prayers of the Cosmos by Daniel Klotz, the translation of the Aramaic Prayer of Jesus. Father, Mother, Birther, and Breath of All, create a space inside of us and fill it with your presence. Let oneness now prevail. Your one desire then flows through ours as energy fills all form. Give us this day our physical and spiritual nourishment and untangle the knots of error that bind us as we release others. Do not let appearances make us forgetful of the source, but free us to act appropriately. From age to age through you flow the glorious harmonies of life. May these words be fertile statements through which our future grows. Amen, amen, and amen. So I'd like to make a few announcements before we turn it over to Reverend Dr. Preston McKeever Floyd. Our conversation circles will continue at Salem Road on Thursday mornings, 1030 to 1130 AM. You can find that information on the Unity Facebook page. Also, our social justice dialogue group uh, is scheduled. The next one is scheduled for October 15th. That's next week. We'll do three Thursday evenings like we did last time from 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, my co-facilitator is Rob Fullwood, Reverend Dr. Rob Fullwood. So again, that starts next Thursday, October 15th. The documentary we'll be discussing is about the work of James Baldwin, some of the writing that he did before his death about his relationships with Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and Medgar Evers. The name of the documentary is I Am Not Your Negro, and you can view it on Netflix. I've seen it for the third time. There's a lot of information and insights and things to consider and looking at the history of our country. And so please join us next Thursday, October 15th. All the Zoom information is on our Unity Myrtle Beach Facebook page. Please always remember two of our biggest outreaches at Unity Myrtle Beach is help for kids and family justice. Always collecting food, clothes, and non-perishable food. 
and you can take those items directly to both groups, Help for Kids or Family Justice, or bring it by the church in Surfside. Again, that information is on our Facebook page and on the general reminder email that we send out each week. If you're not getting that, then that means we don't have your right email. So please, or you're not looking for it in spam. We have learned it hides there sometimes. As always, we give thanks for your ties and donations, all the ways that you support Unity Myrtle Beach, whether it's your time, your talent, your treasure. We give great thanks for your creative consciousness. Once again, we want to take a deep breath. And I'm remembering the prayer of our friend, Kim Downey, a poet from Santa Barbara, California, whose ancestry included Blackfoot Indian and African American. And her prayer was, Grandfather, Grandmother, breathe me in. Turn me into a drop of water that will help the people. Four-legged, winged ones, all sisters, let me in. Turning me into a drop of water that will help the people. White buffalo woman, hold me like a newborn child. Breathe into me and make me a drop of water that will help the people. Blessings on this day and blessing on our hearts and minds as we listen to the words of Reverend Dr. Preston McKeever Floyd. Namaste. <laughs>
Reverend Margaret and Unity Myrtle Beach. It's a pleasure to be with you again, as always. As we prepare for this morning's conversation, I would like to lead us through a meditation based on the acronym, on an acronym for silence. Please breathe in deeply. Exhale. Breathe deeply. Exhale. Breathe deeply. Exhale. Silence. S. Still the mind. We still the mind by breathing and following our breath. Do not seek to control it, but surrender to this moment. I inhale peace. Inhale peace. Exhale anxiety. Inhale peace. Exhale anxiety. Inhale peace. L, let go of worries. Know that in this moment, everything is as it should be. Everything is in divine order. Rest in this knowing. Everything is as it should be. Everything is in divine order. This moment is perfect with nothing lacking. E. Exhale stress. Allow yourself to float on your breath as a leaf on the river. Exhale stress. Float as a beautiful golden fall leaf on the river. N, notice your breath. Be conscious of inhaling and exhaling. Draw yourselves back to your breath. Breathe naturally, but consciously. C, connect to all. We connect to all when remember 
when we remember that we are part of all. I am that I am. I am one with everything that exists. I am one with the all as a wave is with the ocean. I am one with the all as a wave is with the ocean. E, embrace calmness. Embrace calmness. Be at peace. Allow yourselves to embrace calmness. Calmness is one of our greatest powers to achieve. Allow yourself to embrace calmness. Amen. As I was meditating and contemplating what I might share with you today, these things came to me. And so today, really, this is going to be more of a conversation about how I understand and deal with things of the world. The last time I was with you, I purposely didn't mention any particular events, but I wanted to share background spiritual understanding for us to be able to cope with things in this world. And in this sense, it still is an extension of that, but it's really biographical. I'm not asking you to do anything but considering it consider it. I'm not asking you to agree, but I'm, I'm going to share with you what has worked in my life and what continues to work to help me to cope with the world as we all see it and know it. I often contemplate the scripture from the New Testament where Jesus the Christ said, we are to be in the world, but not of the world. And that's not necessarily easy, nor should it be, but that is our challenge. And I certainly have dedicated myself to the teachings and the examples as best we know them, of the Christ. And so I take seriously this statement that we should be in the world, but not of it. And there are some core beliefs that I have that helps keep me grounded and reminded of the principles that I think are bedrock for my life. I've shared with you many times, and some of you may not have heard it, so I'll share it again. When I was a youngster, I didn't yet know what the, know the words contemplation or meditation. But as a, at a very young age, as a lad, I loved to go out into the woods alone. And there was one little feel, and to me, it felt like the, the, the world prime, primeval. Uh, this was the greatest and largest place in the world. When I look at it now, and it's a very small, small plot. 
But I would go out early in the mornings, especially I'd slip out while the family was still asleep on Saturday mornings, and I'd go out and sit in the broom straw in this little plot, this little field. And so I just sit there and sit there in silence and listen in to whatever was be, to be heard, birds chirping or frogs jumping into the little pond or whatever. But sometimes, or most of the time actually, I would lie back on the broom straw and I'd look up at the sky. And in those moments, I felt that I was totally connected to the universe everything in the universe, and the universe was totally connected to me. It was only years later when I discovered that I was being contemplative or meditative. But those youthful moments have guided everything that I have done since, from what I chose to study in college, from what I continue to read, is seeking to understand the connection of myself, of the little self, and to that of the greater self. And this continues to guide me as I look out in the world. Am I disturbed by things in the world? Yes, I am. And I was just reading today Wordsworth's poem where it said, Wordsworth's poem where it said, the world is too much with us. Sometimes it's just too close and it's too much. And as we get involved in the spending and buying and living and dying of the world, we are sometimes consumed by it. And so this is what I think the Christ is speaking to when he says, you're to be in it, but not of it. To be in it is to be aware of the rhythms to be in it is to be aware of the goings and comings. To be in it is to have to live, to have to pay mortgages, to have to pay rent, to buy food, to buy cars. This is to be in the world. But how can I be in it and not be of it? One of the things that has been helpful to me is first to realize that nothing in this world is permanent. Everything is transitory. No matter how we measure it, it is always passing. No matter how strong or real situations seem to us, they are still passing, they are still changing. And in a very real sense, my second core belief is we create our world. Well, how can that be? There are so many things, there are so many injustices that I seem to have nothing to do with. I learned early that sometimes just as a matter of exercise. I take full responsibility for whatever is going on in my life. And when I do that, then I'm able to see clearly that which I'm contributing to my issues and that which is coming from someone else. But if I continually just blame somebody else for my issues, then I don't take responsibility for my part of it. In a very real sense, we are talking about society, but that's an interesting term. Society is made up of us. So in a very real sense, we create society. But it is equally true, unfortunately, that society sometimes turns around and creates us. And that is the paradox that we have to live with, that microcosm and that macrocosm. I'm convinced 
that our souls are stacked with the universe. But it takes us sometimes to realize that. And then it takes being alert and aware and conscious to see it. Because we are always looking outward. Our eyes are set to look outward. And this requires that we look inward. And when we look inward, as I talked about my, med my youthful meditations, I realize that if everything is in the universe is connected to me and I'm connected to everything in the universe, in a real sense, I am the universe and the universe is me. And that helps me sometimes in the world when I have to pull back. I'm very aware of the body I'm in. I'm very aware of the history that I have known and I have lived. But knowing that I also know that there's something in me deeper and far wider than any of those things by which I define myself. And as that is for me, it is for you. To define oneself really is to set limits. And ultimately, I think we are unlimited. We are beyond, there's something in us that goes far beyond anything that we can see. And every now and then we get little glimpses of it. We get little hints, but so often, soon as we get the hint, we watch the news <laughs> and the news immediately make us think, oh, this can't be so because all this foolishness is going on and I need to do something. And indeed you may, but in order to do something, you must first deal with you. Or let me say, I must deal with me. I'm not gonna put it on you. I must deal with me. This is what works for me. And sometimes that requires just being still. One of my colleagues once asked me, how is it that you seem to stay so calm when we are having major discussions or arguments, et cetera, et cetera. So I said, well, I'll share it with you since I think you're sincere. I said, first of all, I start my mornings with silence. I don't turn on the news. That immediately brings the world too close. But I start with silence. And then I may turn on some music. And then I do some reading. Things that help me to connect with the deepest part of myself. And what I found in my career as I did that, that everything I needed to do that day got done. And if during that day, if I would just take a minute or two again of silence to renew that moment, it doesn't have to be long, but just a minute or two to renew that connection, that it helps me to go through things better. Did it mean that it prevented challenges? No, it did not. Did it mean that I haven't had trials and tribulations? No, it does not. But what it does mean is that I was able, and the fact that I'm here today, says that I was able to go through 100% of the worst days of my life and still live. That's what it says. That's what it says. St. Paul said, be not conformed to the world. Don't form yourself like the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the renewing of our minds is not a one-time event. It's a continual event. It's a journey. We have to renew them constantly. We will find that we shift, that things shift in our thinking and we see the world differently. But nonetheless, we have to renew that mind. And he's not talking about the mind of the world, but he's talking about that mind that I was mentioning earlier, that connection to all 
that is. Because despite ourselves, the people that we disagree with, the people that we resist, there's something in, our, in them that relates to us. That is why we have the reaction. We often say that hate is the opposite of love. I, I disagree. When we have hate, we have emotions tied in it. So sometimes, unfortunately, our hate is our highest expression of love. What really is the opposite of love is, is antipathy, where you feel nothing for the situation or nothing for the person. That's the opposite of love. But if you're hating, then there are emotions tied in. So there's something in you that is re relating at a very deep level with that person or situation that you despise. And I've discovered when I realize that, when I consciously remember that, I find myself able to deal with, if not change, people and situations. We know that often at work, we want everything to be perfect. It never is. Even sometimes in our homes, we want the same. It never is. Two people are not going to agree on any one thing all the time. So it is necessary for us to make those adjustments. Do we get passionate sometimes? Oh, yes, we do. Do we argue? Oh, yes, we do. But at some point in our quiet, we must realize that there's a power greater than us that's operating in us, through us, and as us. And I found that way. When I be still, then I find ways to make meaningful contributions to the world despite what seems to be the fashion of the day. The other thing that is very helpful to me, there, are there destructive forces in the universe or in our, in our world? Yes. Be they religious, political, socioeconomic, how, whatever guise they come under, we have destructive elements. But one of the things that helps me is when I realize that inherent in every evil is the seed of its own destruction. Think about that. Inherent in every evil is the seed of its own destruction. And you, all you have to do is look at history real quickly and you'll see that that is so. From Hitler to fascism, to communism and all the other isms that we have fought against, the seed to their destruction was in them. And even with the present situations that we are concerned with, the seed of destruction is within every evil. One of the ways that we deal with evil in the world is to recognize that inherently it cannot last. It never has and it won't now. But in the meantime, we must connect with that greater within us and do whatever thing we can to bring good into the world. One of the things that we have, we, and I know I do, and we have a problem with is that so often we think it has to be something big that has to be done. But I'm learning more and more, no, it doesn't. 
very small things can make tremendous changes in ourselves and in our world. This has been proven again over and over. Physics has definitely taught us this, that just a, a small quantum leap, people talk about a quantum leap as if it's big. No, a quantum leap is very small, but its effects are very large. And the last time I spoke with you, I asked us to create a wall of light by connecting with what we hold to be true. And I wanna continue that. We are messengers of the light in darkness. And as we already know, a very small candle can light a darkened room. You don't fight darkness, you light a candle. Now, what are the candles that we need to light? First is truth. Truth, even if it upsets everything I believe, I have to face truth. And that, that's been a question forever. Well, what is truth? I don't know if we ever, I believe there may be an absolute truth, but we have to inch toward it. But the point is, we do know this. We do know that light is greater than darkness. We also know that the power of love is greater than hate. We know that very well. That's, that's not something we have to, have to worry about. We know this. So our goal must be, in whatever small way we can, to bring light, to bring love, to bring truth. Yes. We see lies being used as manipulation, and it's very disturbing how people accept some lies that are so obvious, but nonetheless they do. So it is necessary for us to continue to stand for truth. And that requires that if there's been something that I have believed forever, and discover evidence of its untruth, then I need to change that. I used to share with my students, they talk about believing different things. I have all sorts of beliefs. I believe all sorts of things, but I have no problem living with the possibility that everything I believe can be wrong. Unfortunately, too many these days think that whatever they believe is the only truth, or whatever position they hold is the position. And I remind friends all the time, no, that is a position, not the position. Think about that. What I'm holding, no matter how strongly, and it works for me, it is a position, not the position. And what that does is keep one, keeps one humble. It gives you humility to realize that, oh yes, I can be wrong. We may know a lot, but we don't know it all. There's always something else to learn. There's always something, some other place to get to. There's always something else to see. But I want you to remember, at least this is as I see the universe, that we are like a hologram. We are a small part of the universe but everything that's in the universe is already in us. And I always think of Aristotle's example when he talked about that, that inherent what we are is our infinite, is infinite potential. We have many seeds inside of us that have not been cultivated. Think about this. This is a good example. 
especially in this season. There are a lot of acorns around. They're very small, but inherent in every acorn is an oak tree, the potential for an oak tree. If that acorn doesn't get eaten by the squirrels or somehow not fall onto dirt, then it won't live to get to see its potential. But if it gets the right situations, then that acorn will become a great oak. And my last example in dealing with the great oak, you've seen, all of us have seen old trees, if not an oak tree, we've seen very old trees and we've seen lichen and moss and all kinds of parasites growing on that tree but that tree is still alive. And the reason is simple. Trees don't die from the outside. Whatever is disturbing has to get on the inside. And that is the lesson that I know best. No matter what anybody says to me or about me, unless I will allow it on the inside of me, it cannot affect me. And this, I close with that thought. Trees do not die from the outside. Whatever must kill it must get inside. So we must be guardians at the doorways of our hearts and our minds. For as a person thinks, in his or her heart, that is who they are. Amen. Let us close with this prayer. Dear Father, Mother, God, Infinite Spirit, Great I am, we are grateful for this moment. We are grateful for this time. We are grateful for the insights that you've given to us. Help us to be aware of what we can do and what we must do to make our lives and the lives of those around us, and the lives of those whom we will not even meet better. Help us not to underestimate the power of one. Help us not to underestimate who we are in you. We bless you. We thank you and we bless all those here this morning. Amen.